Chapter One of Flower Fables. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Flower Fables by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter One The Frost King or The Power of Love. Three little fairies sat in the fields eating their breakfast, each among the leaves of her favorite flower. Daisy, Primrose, and Violet were happy as elves need be. The morning wind gently rocked them to and fro, and the sun shone warmly down upon the dewy grass, where butterflies spread their gay wings, and bees with their deep voices sung among the flowers, while the little birds hopped merrily about to peep at them. On a silvery mushroom was spread the breakfast, little cakes of flower dust lay on a broad green leaf, beside a crimson strawberry. Which, with sugar from the violet and cream from the yellow milkweed, made a fairy meal, and their drink was the dew from the flower's bright leaves. Ah, me, sighed Primrose, throwing herself languidly back. How warm the sun grows! Give me another piece of strawberry, and then I must hasten away to the shadow of the ferns. But while I eat, tell me, dear Violet, why are you all so sad? I have scarce seen a happy face since my return from Roseland. Dear friend, what means it? I will tell you, replied little Violet, the tears gathering in her soft eyes. Our good queen is ever striving to keep the dear flowers from the power of the cruel Frost King. Many ways she tried, but all have failed. She has sent messengers to his court with costly gifts, but all have returned sick for want of sunlight, weary and sad. We have watched over them, heedless of sun or shower, but still his dark spirits do their work, and we are left to weep over our blighted blossoms. Thus have we striven, and in vain, and this night our queen holds counsel for the last time. Therefore we are sad, dear Primrose, for she has toiled and cared for us, and we can do nothing to help or advise her now. It is indeed a cruel thing, replied her friend, but as we cannot help it, we must suffer patiently, and not let the sorrows of others disturb our happiness. But, dear sisters, see you not how high the sun is getting? I have my locks to curl, and my robe to prepare for the evening. Therefore I must be gone, or I shall be brown as a withered leaf in this warm light. So, gathering a tiny mushroom for a parasol, she flew away. Daisy soon followed, and Violet was left alone. Then she spread the table afresh, and to it came fearlessly the busy ant and bee, gay butterfly and bird. Even the poor blind mole and humble worm were not forgotten, and with gentle words she gave to all, while each learned something of their kind little teacher, and the love that made her own heart bright shone alike on all. The ant and bee learned generosity, the butterfly and bird contentment, the mole and worm confidence in the love of others and each went to their home better for the little time they had been with Violet. Evening came, and with it troops of elves to counsel their good queen, who, seated on her mossy throne, looked anxiously upon the throng below, whose glittering wings and rustling robes gleamed like many-colored flowers. At length she rose, and amid the deep silence spoke thus, Dear children, let us not tire of a good work, hard though it be and wearisome, Think of the many little hearts that in their sorrow look to us for help. What would the green earth be without its lovely flowers, and what a lonely home for us? Their beauty fills our hearts with brightness, and their love with tender thoughts. Ought we then to leave them to die uncared for and alone? They give to us their all. Ought we not to toil unceasingly, that they may bloom in peace within their quiet homes? We have tried to gain the love of the stern Frost King, but in vain. His heart is hard as his own icy land. No love can melt, no kindness bring it back to sunlight and to joy. How then may we keep our frail blossoms from his cruel spirits? Who will give us counsel? Who will be our messenger for the last time? Speak, my subjects. Then a great murmuring arose, and many spoke, some for costlier gifts, some for war, and the fearful counseled patience and submission. Long and eagerly they spoke, and their soft voices rose high. Then sweet music sounded on the air, 
and the loud tones were hushed, as in wondering silence the fairies waited what should come. Through the crowd there came a little form, a wreath of pure white violets lay among the bright locks that fell so softly around the gentle face, where a deep blush glowed, as, kneeling at the throne, little Violet said, Dear Queen, we have bent to the Frost King's power, we have borne gifts unto his pride, but have we gone trustingly to him and spoken fearlessly of his evil deeds? Have we shed the soft light of unwearied love around his cold heart, and with patient tenderness shown him how bright and beautiful love can make even the darkest lot? Our messengers have gone fearfully, and with cold looks and courtly words offered him rich gifts, things he cared not for, and with equal pride he has sent them back. Then let me, the weakest of your band, go to him, trusting in the love I know lies hidden in the coldest heart. I will bear only a garland of our fairest flowers. These will I wind about him, and their bright faces, looking lovingly in his, will bring sweet thoughts to his dark mind, and their soft breath steal in like gentle words. Then, when he sees them fading on his breast, will he not sigh that there is no warmth there to keep them fresh and lovely? This will I do, dear queen, and never leave his dreary home, till the sunlight falls on flowers fair as those that bloom in our own dear land. Silently the queen had listened, but now, rising and placing her hand on little Violet's head, she said, turning to the throng below, We in our pride and power have erred, while this, the weakest and lowliest of our subjects, has from the innocence of her own pure heart counseled us more wisely than the noblest of our train. All who will aid our brave little messenger, lift your wands, that we may know who will place their trust in the power of love. Every fairy wand glistened in the air, as with silvery voices they cried, Love and little Violet! Then down from the throne, hand in hand, came the queen and Violet, and till the moon sank did the fairies toil, to weave a wreath of the fairest flowers. Tenderly they gathered them, with the night dew fresh upon their leaves, and as they wove chanted sweet spells, and whispered fairy blessings on the bright messengers whom they sent forth to die in a dreary land, that their gentle kindred might bloom unharmed. At length it was done, and the fair flowers lay glowing in the soft starlight, while beside them stood the fairies, singing to the music of the wind-harps, we are sending you, dear flowers, forth alone to die, where your gentle sisters may not weep, or the cold graves where you lie. But you go to bring them fadeless life in the bright homes where they dwell, and you softly smile that tis so, as we sadly sing farewell. O oh, plead with gentle words for us, and whisper tenderly, of generous love to that cold heart, and it will answer ye. And though you fade in a dreary home, yet loving hearts will tell of the joy and peace that you have given. Flowers, dear flowers, farewell. The morning sun looked softly down upon the broad green earth, which like a mighty altar was sending up clouds of perfume from its breast, while flowers danced gaily in the summer wind, and birds sang their morning hymn among the cool green leaves. Then high above, on shining wings, soared a little form, the sunlight rested softly on the silken hair, and the winds fanned lovingly the bright face, and brought the sweetest odors to cheer her on. Thus went Violet through the clear air, and the earth looked smiling up to her, as with the bright wreath folded in her arms, she flew among the soft white clouds. On and on she went, over hill and valley, broad rivers and rustling woods, till the warm sunlight passed away, the winds grew cold, and the air thick with falling snow. Then far below she saw the Frost King's home. Pillars of hard, gray ice supported the high, arched roof, hung with crystal icicles. Dreary gardens lay around, filled with withered flowers and bare, drooping trees, while heavy clouds hung low in the dark sky, and a cold wind murmured sadly through the wintry air. With a beating heart Violet folded her fading wreath more closely to her breast, and with weary wings flew onward to the dreary palace. Here, before the closed doors, stood many forms with dark faces and harsh, discordant voices, who sternly asked the shivering little fairy why she came to them. Gently she answered, telling them her errand, beseeching them to let her pass ere the cold wind blighted her frail blossoms. Then they flung wide the doors, and she passed in. 
Walls of ice, carved with strange figures, were around her. Glittering icicles hung from the high roof, and soft white snow covered the hard floors. On a throne hung with clouds sat the Frost King. A crown of crystals bound his white locks, and a dark mantle wrought with delicate frostwork was folded over his cold breast. His stern face could not stay little Violet, and on through the long hall she went, heedless of the snow that gathered on her feet, and the bleak wind that blew around her, while the king with wondering eyes looked on the golden light that played upon the dark walls as she passed. The flowers, as if they knew their part, unfolded their bright leaves, and poured forth their sweetest perfume, as, kneeling at the throne, the brave little fairy said, O king of blight and sorrow, send me not away till I have brought back the light and joy that will make your dark home bright and beautiful again. Let me call back to the desolate gardens the fair forms that are gone, and their soft voices blessing you will bring to your breast a never-failing joy. Cast by your icy crown and scepter, and let the sunlight of love fall softly on your heart. Then will the earth bloom again in all its beauty, and your dim eyes will rest only on fair forms, while music shall sound through these dreary halls, and the love of grateful hearts will be yours. Have pity on the gentle flower spirits, and do not doom them to an early death, when they might bloom in fadeless beauty, making us wiser by their gentle teachings, and the earth brighter by their lovely forms. These fair flowers, with the prayers of all fairyland, I lay before you. Oh, send me not away till they are answered. And with tears falling thick and fast upon their tender leaves, Violet laid the wreath at his feet, while the golden light grew ever brighter as it fell upon the little form so humbly kneeling there. The king's stern face grew milder as he gazed on the gentle fairy, and the flowers seemed to look beseechingly upon him, while their fragrant voices sounded softly in his ear, telling of their dying sisters, and of the joy it gives to bring happiness to the weak and sorrowing. But he drew the dark mantle closer over his breast and answered coldly, I cannot grant your prayer, little fairy. It is my will the flowers should die. Go back to your queen and tell her that I cannot yield my power to please these foolish flowers. Then Violet hung the wreath above the throne, and with weary foot went forth again, out into the cold, dark gardens, and still the golden shadows followed her, and wherever they fell, flowers bloomed and green leaves rustled. Then came the frost spirits, and beneath their cold wings the flowers died, while the spirits bore Violet to a low, dark cell, saying as they left her that their king was angry that she had dared to stay when he had bid her go. So all alone she sat, and sad thoughts of her happy home came back to her, and she wept bitterly. But soon came visions of the gentle flowers dying in their forest homes, and their voices ringing in her ear, imploring her to save them. Then she wept no longer, but patiently awaited what might come. Soon the golden light gleamed faintly through the cell, and she heard little voices calling for help, and high up among the heavy cobwebs hung poor little flies struggling to free themselves, while their cruel enemies sat in their nets watching their pain. With her wand the fairy broke the bands that held them, tenderly bound up their broken wings, and healed their wounds, while they lay in the warm light and feebly hummed their thanks to their kind deliverer. Then she went to the ugly brown spiders, and in gentle words told them how in fairyland their kindred spun all the elven cloth, and in return the fairies gave them food, and then how happily they lived among the green leaves, spinning garments for their neighbors. And you too, said she, shall spin for me, and I will give you better food than helpless insects. You shall live in peace, and spin your delicate threads into a mantle for the stern king, and I will weave golden threads amid the gray, that when folded over his cold heart, gentle thoughts may enter in and make it their home. And while she gaily sung, the little weavers spung their silken threads, the flies on glittering wings flew lovingly above her head, and over all the golden light shone softly down. When the frost spirits told their king, he greatly wondered and often stole to look at the sunny little room where friends and enemies worked peacefully together. Still the light grew brighter, and floated out into the cold air, where it hung like bright clouds above the dreary gardens, whence all the spirit's power could not drive it. 
and green leaves budded on the naked trees, and flowers bloomed, but the spirits heaped snow upon them, and they bowed their heads and died. At length the mantle was finished, and amid the gray threads shone golden ones, making it bright, and she sent it to the king, entreating him to wear it, for it would bring peace and love to dwell within his breast. But he scornfully threw it aside, and bade his spirits take her to a colder cell, deep in the earth, and there with harsh words they left her. Still she sang gaily on, and the falling drops kept time so musically, that the king in his cold ice-halls wondered at the low sweet sounds that came stealing up to him. Thus Violet dwelt, and each day the golden light grew stronger, and from among the crevices of the rocky walls came troops of little velvet-coated moles, praying that they might listen to the sweet music and lie in the warm light. We lead, said they, a dreary life in the cold earth. The flower roots are dead, and no soft dews descend for us to drink, no little seed or leaf can we find. Ah, good fairy, let us be your servants. Give us but a few crumbs of your daily bread, and we will do all in our power to serve you. And Violet said yes, so day after day they labored to make a pathway through the frozen earth, that she might reach the roots of the withered flowers, and soon, wherever through the dark galleries she went, the soft light fell upon the roots of flowers, and they with new life spread forth in the warm ground, and forced fresh sap to the blossoms above. Brightly they bloomed and danced in the soft light, and the frost spirits tried in vain to harm them, for when they came beneath the bright clouds their power to do evil left them. From his dark castle the king looked out on the happy flowers, who nodded gaily to him, and in sweet colors strove to tell him of the good little spirit, who toiled so faithfully below, that they might live. And when he turned from the brightness without, to his stately palace, it seemed so cold and dreary, that he folded Violet's mantle around him, and sat beneath the faded wreath upon his ice-carved throne, wondering at the strange warmth that came from it, till at length he bade his spirits bring the little fairy from her dismal prison. Soon they came hastening back, and prayed him to come and see how lovely the dark cell had grown. The rough floor was spread with deep green moss, and over wall and roof grew flowery vines, filling the air with their sweet breath, while above played the clear, soft light, casting rosy shadows on the glittering drops that lay among the fragrant leaves, and beneath the vines stood Violet, casting crumbs to the downy little moles who ran fearlessly about and listened as she sang to them. When the old king saw how much fairer she had made the dreary cell than his palace rooms, gentle thoughts within whispered him to grant her prayer, and let the little fairy go back to her friends and home. But the frost spirits breathed upon the flowers, and bid him see how frail they were, and useless to a king. Then the stern, cold thoughts came back again, and he harshly bid her follow him. With a sad farewell to her little friends she followed him, and before the throne awaited his command. When the king saw how pale and sad the gentle face had grown, how thin her robe and weak her wings, and yet how lovingly the golden shadows fell around her and brightened as they lay upon the wand, which, guided by patient love, had made his once desolate home so bright, he could not be cruel to the one who had done so much for him, and in kindly tone he said, Little fairy, I offer you two things, and you may choose between them. If I will vow never more to harm the flowers you may love, will you go back to your own people and leave me and my spirits to work our will on all the other flowers that bloom? The earth is broad, and we can find them in any land, then why should you care what happens to their kindred if your own are safe? Will you do this? Ah, answered Violet sadly, do you not know that beneath the flower's bright leaves there beats a little heart that loves and sorrows like our own? And can I, heedless of their beauty, doom them to pain and grief, that I might save my own dear blossoms from the cruel foes to which I leave them? Ah, no, sooner would I dwell for ever in your darkest cell, than lose the love of those warm, trusting hearts. Then listen, said the king, to the task I give you. You shall raise up for me a palace fairer than this, and if you can work that miracle, I will grant your prayer, or lose my kingly crown. And now go forth and begin your task. My spirits shall not harm you, and I will wait till it is done before I blight another flower. 
Then out into the gardens went Violet with a heavy heart, for she had toiled so long her strength was nearly gone. But the flowers whispered their gratitude and folded their leaves as if they blessed her, and when she saw the garden filled with loving friends, who strove to cheer and thank her for her care, courage and strength returned, and raising up thick clouds of mist that hid her from the wondering flowers, alone and trustingly she began her work. As time went by, the Frost King feared the task had been too hard for the fairy. Sounds were heard behind the walls of mist, bright shadows seemed to pass within, but the little voice was never heard. Meanwhile the golden light had faded from the garden, the flowers bowed their heads, and all was dark and cold as when the gentle fairy came. And to the stern king his home seemed more desolate and sad, for he missed the warm light, the happy flowers, and, more than all, the gay voice and bright face of little Violet. So he wandered through his dreary palace, wondering how he had been content to live before without sunlight and love. And little Violet was mourned as dead in fairyland, and many tears were shed, for the gentle fairy was beloved by all, from the queen down to the humblest flower. Sadly they watched over every bird and blossom which she had loved, and strove to be like her in kindly words and deeds. They wore cypress wreaths, and spoke of her as one whom they should never see again. Thus they dwelt in deepest sorrow, till one day there came to them an unknown messenger, wrapped in a dark mantle, who looked with wondering eyes on the bright palace, and flower-crowned elves, who kindly received him, and brought fresh dew and rosy fruit to refresh the weary stranger. Then he told them that he came from the Frost King, who begged the queen and all her subjects to come and see the palace little Violet had built, for the veil of mist would soon be withdrawn, and as she could not make a fairer home than the ice castle, the king wished her kindred near to comfort and to bear her home. And while the elves wept, he told them how patiently she had toiled, how her fadeless love had made the dark cell bright and beautiful. These and many other things he told them, for little Violet had won the love of many of the frost spirits, and even when they killed the flowers she had toiled so hard to bring to life and beauty, she spoke gentle words to them, and sought to teach them how beautiful is love. Long stayed the messenger, and deeper grew his wonder that the fairy could have left so fair a home, to toil in the dreary palace of his cruel master, and suffer cold and weariness, to give life and joy to the weak and sorrowing. When the elves had promised they would come, he bade farewell to happy fairyland and flew sadly home. At last the time had arrived, and out in his barren garden, under a canopy of dark clouds, sat the frost king before the misty wall, behind which were heard low, sweet sounds, as of rustling trees and warbling birds. Soon through the air came many colored troops of elves. First the queen, known by the silver lilies on her snowy robe, and the bright crown in her hair, beside whom flew a band of elves in crimson and gold, making sweet music in their flower trumpets, while all around, with smiling faces and bright eyes, fluttered her loving subjects. On they came, like a flock of brilliant butterflies, their shining wings and many-colored garments sparkling in the dim air, and soon the leafless trees were gay with living flowers, and their sweet voices filled the gardens with music. Like his subjects, the king looked on the lovely elves, and no longer wondered that little Violet wept and longed for her home. Darker and more desolate seemed his stately home, and when the fairies asked for flowers, he felt ashamed that he had none to give them. At length a warm wind swept through the gardens, and the mist clouds passed away, while in silent wonder looked the frost king and the elves upon the scene before them. Far as the eye could reach were tall green trees, whose drooping boughs made graceful arches, through which the golden light shone softly, making bright shadows on the deep green moss below, where the fairest flowers waved in the cool wind, and sang, in their low sweet voices, how beautiful is love. Flowering vines folded their soft leaves around the trees, making green pillars of their rough trunks. Fountains threw their bright waters to the roof, and flocks of silver-winged birds flew singing among the flowers, or brooded lovingly above their nests. Doves with gentle eyes cooed among the green leaves, snow-white clouds floated in the sunny sky, and the golden light, brighter than before, shone softly down. 
Soon through the long aisles came Violet, flowers and green leaves rustling as she passed. On she went to the Frost King's throne, bearing two crowns, one of sparkling icicles, the other of pure white lilies, and kneeling before him said, My task is done, and, thanks to the spirits of earth and air, I have made as fair a home as elven hands can form. You must now decide. Will you be king of Flowerland, and own my gentle kindred for your loving friends? Will you possess unfading peace and joy, and the grateful love of all the green earth's fragrant children? Then take this crown of flowers. But if you can find no pleasure here, go back to your own cold home, and dwell in solitude and darkness, where no ray of sunlight or of joy can enter. Send forth your spirits to carry sorrow and desolation over the happy earth, and win for yourself the fear and hatred of those who would so gladly love and reverence you. Then take this glittering crown, hard and cold as your own heart will be, if you will shut out all that is bright and beautiful. Both are before you. Choose. The old king looked at the little fairy, and saw how lovingly the bright shadows gathered around her, as if to shield her from every harm. The timid birds nestled in her bosom, and the flowers grew fairer as she looked upon them, while her gentle friends, with tears in their bright eyes, folded their hands beseechingly and smiled on her. Kind thought came thronging to his mind, and he turned to look at the two palaces. Violets, so fair and beautiful, with its rustling trees, calm sunny skies, and happy birds and flowers, all created by her patient love and care. His own, so cold and dark and dreary, his empty gardens where no flowers could bloom, no green trees dwell, or gay birds sing, all desolate and dim. And while he gazed, his own spirits, casting off their dark mantles, knelt before him and besought him not to send them forth to blight the things the gentle fairies loved so much. We have served you long and faithfully, said they. Give us now our freedom, that we may learn to be beloved by the sweet flowers we have harmed so long. Grant the little fairy's prayer, and let her go back to her own dear home. She has taught us that love is mightier than fear. Choose the flower crown, and we will be the truest subjects you have ever had. Then, amid a burst of wild sweet music, the Frost King placed the flower crown on his head, and knelt to little Violet, while far and near, over the broad green earth, sounded the voices of flowers, singing their thanks to the gentle fairy, and the summer wind was laden with perfumes, which they sent as tokens of their gratitude. And wherever she went, old trees bent down to fold their slender branches round her, flowers laid their soft faces against her own and whispered blessings. Even the humble moss bent over the little feet and kissed them as they passed. The old king, surrounded by the happy fairies, sat in Violet's lovely home, and watched his icy castle melt away beneath the bright sunlight, while his spirits, cold and gloomy no longer, danced with the elves, and waited on their king with loving eagerness. Brighter grew the golden light, gayer sang the birds, and the harmonious voices of grateful flowers, sounding over the earth, carried new joy to all their gentle kindred. Brighter shone the golden shadows, on the cool wind softly came, the low sweet tones of happy flowers, singing little Violet's name. Among the green trees was it whispered, and the bright waves bore it on, to the lonely forest flowers, where the glad news had not gone. Thus the Frost King lost his kingdom, and his power to harm and blight. Violet conquered, and his cold heart, warmed with music, love, and light. And his fair home, once so dreary, gay with lovely elves and flowers, brought a joy that never faded through the long bright summer hours. Thus by Violet's magic power all dark shadows passed away, and o'er the home of happy flowers the golden light forever lay. Thus the fairy mission ended, and all flower land was taught the power of love by gentle deeds that little Violet wrought. As sunny lock ceased, another little elf came forward, and this was the tale of Silver Wing told. End of chapter 1. Recording by Tricia G.